Father, we praise you and thank you for this opportunity once again to gather together in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your word, for this opportunity, and for your Holy Spirit that we would just ask might come upon us all to open your word to our hearts and instill in us that response you would have of us, that we might be more pleasing in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, we're in the book of Numbers, chapter 31. And chapter 31 is one of the strangest chapters in the scripture in that it raises a lot of questions that scholars have had a tough time rationalizing uh, or, or dealing with. And uh, the uh, judgment on Midian, prepare you in advance. This is rough stuff, violent, it will shock us. It will be more extreme than you and I would think one would find in so uh, hallowed a place. Um, Midian, as we all recall, um, caused, tried to get Israel to stumble by having the women mix with the Israeli men with the purpose of getting them to worship idols and with the purpose of, of having God turn against Israel. A stratagem suggested to the Midianites by Balak, uh, Balaam, the, uh, the prophet. So we have a nation here that is to be judged, but the degree of God's judgment on Midian has caused much comment. I can't add anything to it. Uh, it'll... The more you think about it, the more disturbing it is. Let's jump in. Chapter 31, verse 1. And the Lord <clears throat> spoke unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Afterward shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. That's, of course, directed reminding Moses that he's got one last task to do. And the task is to avenge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We are not to avenge. In this case, God is instructing Moses to avenge on his behalf. Verse 3, And Moses spoke unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. Of every tribe a thousand, throughout all the tribes of Israel, shall ye send to war. This whole episode in this chapter is going to take place by 12, a, a, a task force, a special elite corps of 12,000. But they're going to set out to, uh, on a strange task. Verse 5, So they're delivered out of the thousands of Israel, a thousand of the every tribe, 12,000 armed, armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand of every tribe, them and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest, to the war. That's also strange. The high priest didn't go to war, but his son, the heir apparent, did. It's also unprecedented, unusual. There it is. Phineas, now, you recall, Phineas distinguished himself by averting the plague. By, He's the javelin thrower of the nation Israel. If you recall, he, he pierced them both. He skewered the two of them, um, and it was his zeal that set aside the plague that God had sent upon the nation. So Phineas, our javelin thrower, uh, the son of Eleazar the priest, go to the war with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. Now, so far, so good. You figure, okay. They killed all, you know, the combatants, these 12,000, killed them all, all the males. First thing, you can't help but be impressed. We really don't know how many Midianite men they were against. We reasonably infer there were more than 12,000. How large is a matter of speculation. Verse 8. 
And they slew the kings of Midian, besides the rest of them that were slain, namely, uh, Evi and Rechem and Zur and Hur and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. And we know from the scripture, this was not in battle. It was a judicial execution. In other words, don't assume that Balaam just happened to be in the melee. He was judicially executed. And five kings. Now, might mention one thing that is may clear up some confusion. As we read this chapter, you will get the impression that all of the Midianites are here being uh, slaughtered. The references to these five kings, when we compare this to Joshua 13, it turns out these particular five Midianite kings were vassals of uh, the Amorite king of Sihon, which they previously defeated. So from this, some scholars believe that the subject of this chapter are the tribes that fall under those five kings, not all the Midianites. Still a bunch, don't misunderstand me. But this also explains how that 200 years later the Midianites show up in strength again. If they're literally all slaughtered, you know, it raises a problem. There is a belief among some scholars that five key, these five kings and the tribes under them were the focus of the whole issue. These were in that territory that later becomes Reuben's territory. Um, we'll come to that later in our study uh, tonight. But the point is, is that uh, it could very well be that this is focusing on this particular uh, group. Um, but that's, again, uh, scholastic inference rather than sound uh, um, issues here. Um, okay, verse 9. The children of Israel took all the women of Midian captives and their little ones and took spoil of all the cattle and all their flocks and all their goods. And they burned all their cities wherein they dwelt and all their encampments with fire. And they took all the spoil and all the prey of men and of beasts. Now even so far, you see, we could sort of relate to that. They killed off the men, taken the women captives, and took, of course took spoil of all the flocks and so forth. Verse 12, And they brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and Eleazar the priest, and unto the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by the Jordan near Jericho. And Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them outside the camp. And Moses was angry with the officers of the host, with the captains over the thousands, and the captains over the hundreds, which came from the battle. And Moses said to them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Moses is asking an interesting question. Have you saved all the women alive? When they had their problem with Midian, who were the most dangerous? The women. So you women's livers, I want you to notice that Moses is, you know, putting the women first here. Um, Have you saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now therefore kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. Think about it a minute. These 12,000 soldiers had to kill all the women that were not virgins. That's a tough assignment. Now, I'm not being flippant or cute here. And they're also killing the male children. The male children and all the women that are non-virgins are to be slaughtered. That's the edict that Moses gives. There's no easy way to get comfortable with that. That has to, if you really understand what's going on here, it has to offend our humanistic tendencies. But that was God's commandment. Verse 18. But all the female children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. And do ye abide outside the camp seven days? 
Whosoever hath killed any person, and whosoever hath toucheth any slain, purify both yourselves and your captives on the third day and on the seventh day. Remember, we went through all that. Purifying yourselves if you touch anything dead. Okay. After they've slaughtered their subjects, they have to go through ceremonial purification, as we learned earlier in the book. Verse 20. And purify all your raiment, and all that is made of skins, and all work of goat's hair, and all things made of wood. And Eliezer the priest said unto the men of war who went to battle, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord commanded Moses. And by the way, this is the first place in the scripture where the high priest interprets the law. So you have to know the law was given by Moses, and Moses did the declaring. This is the first place where now the, the high priest is beginning to step into that role. Even though Moses, Moses is still alive here. I've <clears throat> said, this is the ordinance of which the uh, of the law which the Lord commanded Moses. Only the gold and the silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, and the lead, everything that may abide the fire, ye shall make it go through the fire, and it shall be clean. So, in other words, these are heathen utensils, heathen uh, materials, and so forth. So they're cleansing it by purification. Nevertheless, it shall be purified with the water of separation. All that abideth not the fire, ye shall make go through the water. And ye shall wash your clothes on the seventh day, and ye shall be clean. Afterward, uh, ye shall come into the camp. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take the sum of the prey that was taken, both of man and of beast, thou and Eleazar the priest, and the principal fathers of the congregation, and divide the prey unto two parts, between them that took the war upon them, who went out to battle, and between all the congregation. And levy it tribute unto the Lord, of the men of war who went out to the battle, one soul of five hundred, both of the persons, and of the oxen, and of the asses, and of the sheep. Take it of their half, and give it unto Eliezer the priest, for a heave offering, or heave is a strange word for you, a lift offering, they hold it up. They don't, they don't burn it, consume it. They hold it up and dedicate the Lord, and it belongs to the, the priest. <clears throat> a heave offering to the Lord, verse 30. And the children of Israel's half, thou shalt take one portion of fifty, of the persons and our oxen and the asses and of the flocks and of all the manner of beasts and give uh, them unto the Levites who keep the charge of the tabernacle of the Lord. And Moses and Eliezer the priest did as the Lord commanded Moses and the booty being the rest of the prey which the men of war had caught was 600,000 and 70,000 and 5,000 sheep and threescore and 12,000 oxen and threescore and 1,000 asses and 32,000 persons and all of women that had not known man by lying uh, with him. And the half which was the portion of them who went out to war was in number 300,000 and seven and 30,500 sheep. And the Lord's tribute of the sheep was 603 score and 15 and the oxen were 36,000 of which the Lord's tribute was three score and 12. And the asses were 30,000 and 500 of which the Lord's tribute was three score and one. And the persons were 16,000, of which the Lord's tribute was 30 and two persons. The Lord, Moses gave the tribute, which was the Lord's heave offering unto Eliezer the priest, as the Lord commanded Moses. And the children of Israel's half, which the, Moses divided from the men that warred. Now the half that pertained unto the congregation was 300,000 and 30,000 and 7,500 sheep and 30 and 6,000 uh, oxen and 30,000 asses and, and uh, 500 and 16,000 persons. Even of the children of Israel's half, Moses took one portion of 50, both man and beast, and gave them unto the Levites, who kept the charge of the tabernacle of the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. Tedious reading, but it is, a, it is an official chronicle, official log, official reckoning of, of the, of the uh, follow-through of what God had commanded. Uh, verse 48, And the officers who were over the thousands of the hosts, and the captains of the thousands, and the captains of the hundreds, came near unto Moses. And they said unto Moses, Thy servants have taken the sum of the men of war who were under our charge, and there lacketh not one man of us. By the way, that's interesting in itself. 12,000 men detached to undertake this assignment. Slaughtered all the men of Midian. Executed the rest of this. What were the losses? Zero. None. Dramatic in secular terms, um, profound in spiritual terms. 12,000 men. And as military engagements go, that's not a heavy force. 
We have therefore brought an oblation for the Lord, what every man hath gotten of jewels of gold, of, of chains and bracelets and rings and earrings and necklaces to make an atonement for our souls before the Lord. And Moses and Eliezer, the priest, took the gold of them, even all, all wrought jewels, and all the gold of the offering that they offered up to the Lord of the captains of the thousands and of the captains of the hundreds was 16,750 shekels where the men of war had taken spoil, every man for himself. And Moses and Eliezer the priest took the gold of the captains of the thousands and of the hundreds and brought it to the tabernacle of the congregation for memorial of the children um, of Israel before the Lord. Okay. Strange chapter. Um, can't add a lot to it. We look at this and we can't help but be disturbed by the um, what would seem to us this ruthless execution. And yet um, what God is teaching them, and he's going to instruct them to do the same thing when they take Canaan. And uh, when, we get the, when we study the book of Joshua, we ran into this. Rigorous um, uh, exterminations in front of them. Now, uh, why would God do this? Because they were sinners? Lots of other places where people are sinners and, and, and you, you, you're, you know, he doesn't go to this extreme. In this particular case, the one distinction we can make is that they deliberately um, made use of the sins to, as weapons against God's chosen. And that seems to distinguish this situation from others. Uh, that's worthy of note. There's another idea, though, uh, Romans 15.4 says that whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, yours and mine. And so as you and I read chapter 31 of Numbers, uh, we can look at it as quaint history. Um, we may or may not be able to relate to the, extre ex the extremeness of it all, if I can use that word. Um, what are we to learn from this? I'm going to suggest to you one possibility. And that is, is that God would have us exterminate sinful lusts, not compromise. The lusts that war against the soul. The continuation of the Midianites jeopardized God's plan for Israel. When they go into the promised land, they are like, uh, also instructed to wipe out their enemies there. I'm not suggesting you and I should wipe out our enemies. I am suggesting that their enemies represent a jeopardy of God's chosen people. And uh, the analogy here, the spiritual analogy, is sinful lusts. That's exactly what Midian typified. That's exactly what tools they use to undo the, cho the, the uh, children of God. And uh, because of that, God was uh, uncompromising in uh, avenging himself on Midian. And um, the spiritual lesson here might well be for you and I to take a good hard look at ourselves and our lives. Do we really put the lusts of the flesh to death? Or do we compromise it with them? Or do we wink at them? Or do we, do we um, um, take it less seriously? God clearly takes it very seriously. And I think Numbers 31 is there to make that point, if none other. Um, but we'll move on. Chapter 32. Now we get in this place where a couple of the two and a half tribes, you're going to constantly hear later on of the two and a half tribes. Two tribes and half of Manasseh. Bear in mind, see, they're still east of the Jordan. They have not entered, the, entered into Canaan yet. That's going to happen in the book of Joshua. But they're getting ready to cross over. That's what this book is, leads up to. Two tribes like what they see just east of the Jordan. They like it here. Hey, you guys go ahead and take Canaan. We're going to stick around here. They want to compromise. Very strange posture to take. High risk posture to take, by the way. We'll get into all of that. But this is the place where they make this decision, which indeed is honored in the book of Joshua. The, uh, at first Moses says no, but then uh, he, uh, he later gives in. Uh, Let's just, uh, uh, Numbers 32, verse 1. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. Apparently more than the rest per head. 
And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that, behold, the place was a place for cattle. And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke unto Moses and unto Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Ataroth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and Eliel and Sebam and Nebo and beyond, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel, is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over the Jordan. Sure, interesting. You know, back at Kadesh Barnea, God gives them the land. Take it. It's yours. The land of milk and honey. Send 12 spies in, and 10 of the spies say, it's too rough for us. We can't do it. And that, of course, leads to the 40 years stalemate, uh, wandering, the, the treading water. They start out with 600,000. They end up, after 40 years, with still 600,000 until our generation dies. Now they're ready to go over, and... <laughs> A couple of them like it where it is. They want to stay east of the Jordan. And um, the more you think about it, you, on the one hand, superficially, you can say, gee, that's understandable. They, they've seen this land. It's good for cattle. It's fertile. Uh, what's across the river, they don't know. Uh, they're willing to, they, they would just soon settle for this and let the other go. Uh, that actually is a, uh, the more you, it's a very rash irresponsible posture to take. Because first of all, they have no idea what God has set aside for their inheritance. That wasn't it. Their inheritance was scheduled to be on the other side of Jordan. Secondly, it's also interesting, is it puts them in great jeopardy. Because what protection do they have in that land from, you know, um, uh, threats even further eastward or northward or wherever? So it's, a, it's, it's a, uh, in many respects, an irresponsible posture to take. Um, verse 6. Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and you, ye shall sit here? See, his first upset is he's going to lose one-sixth of his army because the two, two of the twelve tribes are going to stay put. The rest of you know, the other... Uh, ten are going to cross the Jordan and go and, and, and take on the Amorites and all these other guys. Moses goes on, Wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. And when they went up in, unto the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go to the land which the Lord had given them. The Lord's anger was kindled at the same time, and he swore, saying, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land which I swore to give Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and uh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. The Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. And behold, ye are risen up in your father's stead, an increase of sinful men, to augment yet the fierce anger of the Lord toward Israel. For if ye turn away from after him, he will yet again leave them in the wilderness, and ye shall destroy all this people. Moses didn't mess around, did he? And he laid it on the line. Verse 16. And they came near unto him and said, We will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and cities for our little ones, but we ourselves will go ready armed before the children of Israel until we have brought them unto their place. And our little ones shall dwell in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return unto our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on the other side of the Jordan or beyond, because our inheritance is fallen to us on this side of the Jordan eastward. See what they're proposing, which itself is kind of gutsy. They leave their women and children in some fortified cities. The armed men will go along and stay with the army. They don't know how long the conquest is going to take. Seven years? It's going to be a while. And, uh, but there, whatever it is, they'll do. 
with the idea that once the land is conquered and the nation has their inheritance, then they'll retire to their inheritance, which will be east of the Jordan. That's their proposal. Verse 20, And Moses said unto them, If ye will do this thing, if ye will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go all of you armed over the Jordan before the Lord, until he hath driven out his enemies from before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward ye shall return, and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Build you cities for your little ones, and folds for your sheep, and do that which hath proceeded out of your mouth, and the children of Gad and the children of Reuben spoke unto Moses, saying, Thy servants will do as my Lord commandeth. Our little ones, our wives, our flocks, and all our cattle shall be there in the cities of Gilead. But thy servants shall pass over, every man armed for war, before the Lord to battle, as my Lord saith. So concerning them, Moses commanded Eleazar the priest, and Joshua the son of Nun, and the chief fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. And Moses said unto them, If the children of Gad and the children of Reuben will pass with you over the Jordan, every man armed to battle before the Lord, and the land shall be subdued before you, then ye shall give them the land of Gilead for a possession. But if they will not pass over with you armed, they shall have possession among you uh, in the uh, land of Canaan. And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben answered, saying, As the Lord hath said unto thy servants, we will, so will we do. We will pass over armed before the Lord into the land of Canaan, that the possession of our inheritance on this side of the Jordan may be ours. And Moses gave unto them, even the, to the children of Gad, and to the children of Reuben, and unto the half-tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, the king, the king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, the king of Bashan, the land with the cities thereof, within the borders, even the cities of the countries round about. And the children of Gad built Dibon, Eteroth and Error, <laughs> and a bunch of other names I can't pronounce properly. Um, fortified cities and folds for sheep, verse 36. And the children of Reuben built Heshbon and Eliah and Kiriathaim, and Nebo and Baalmeon, their names being changed, and Shibna and other <laughs> names unto the cities which they builded. And the children of the maker, the son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and took it and dispossessed the Amorites who were in it. And Moses gave Gilead unto the maker, the son of Manasseh, and he dwelt therein. And uh, Jair, the son of Manasseh, went and took the small towns thereof and called them Havoth Jair. And uh, Nobath went and took Kenath and the villages thereof and called it Nobath after his own name. So, and uh, that's chapter uh, 32. Um, a couple of small points uh, back here in verse 34 where uh, the children of Gad built Dibbon. It was in the city of Dibbon that the Moabite stone was found. Those of you that follow archaeology know that that's a very pivotal find in terms of understanding of languages. It, uh, Moabite stone was found at Dibbon. But uh, what we have here is in the fact a reflection, um, despite the fact that they acquitted themselves pretty sportingly. Gee, they, they'll stay with the army and accomplish the military objectives before they take the land. Still, it is an expression of self-indulgence. In other words, um, there, it raises all kinds of questions, not the least of which is um, they, are, they have to be, by definition, unacquainted with, God, with, with what God had um, destined for their inheritance. They forewent that for their own choice. And um, you and I risk the same thing every day. Whenever we uh, are self-willed, rather than put ourselves in subjection to what God has in mind for us, when we rush in to take charge of something or to gain something for ourselves, we do that uh, not knowing what the Lord might have right around the corner, and uh, uh, which could be uh, vastly better if we would give Him a chance. Self-will, self-indulgence. Now, what was the result? Now, it, it's interesting here. The risks they took on were enormous because. There could have been marauding bands. They could have gotten their women and children and their cattle while they're off to war, um, and so on. Um, but the other side of this is is the penalty, the really the, the the tragedy of this story is that they got what they bargained for. 
because after the conquest of Canaan, when we get to Joshua, particularly Joshua 22, we see, in fact, after the conquest is complete, that they are allowed to go back and they take this land. It is a source of trouble for the nation Israel for hundreds of years afterward because it is that portion of the area that is exposed to their enemies. So when their enemies attack, uh, that's one of the first places that falls. Uh, one of the places is a place called Golan. Did we pick that up yet? It'll be showing up here. Uh, that's the area up there. And um, so they also have, in effect, permanently isolated themselves from the brethren by being east of the Jordan. They're not quite part of the action. It's a, it's a, it's a, in a national sense, a tragedy. But uh, and if you study the history of, of the nation Israel subsequent, you'll. Uh, be sensitive to the fact that uh, that portion of the uh, Reuben Gad and the, what they call the Reuben Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh, which settled in the, on east of the Jordan, uh, are out of it. They're not in the in the mainstream. They're not. Uh, uh, they're isolated from their brethren. It's interesting. Reuben and Gad. If you all recall, I'm sure you all recall our study of the lay of the camp. Reuben and Gad and Simeon were on the south side of the tabernacle. They camped together. Simeon gets reduced to 22,000 in the second census, right? So because, for whatever reasons. So they're, they're primarily the Reubenites and Gadites. Gadites they're, they are uh, camped together on the south side, and that apparently led to this unusual form of fellowship that reflects itself in the proposals of uh, Numbers 32. Okay. Moving right along. Um, the lessons, I guess, uh, from 32 would be just this whole idea of uh, self-indulgence. Uh, this idea of self-indulgence, by the way, and the idea of, uh, of um, um, our choices. The more you study the Scripture, the more you are drawn to the realization that you want to make sure that every choice you make is what God really intends for you. Um, do, you remember, do you remember the Scripture where it says, He will wipe away the tears of our eyes? Remember that passage? Um, when does he do that? When does he wipe our tears away? Anyone? Millennium? Eternity? Why are we having tears there? No sin. Why do we have tears? Why is he wiping tears from our eyes? Could it be that our, the tears come from that which we might have inherited? if we had made some better choices here? Is it a question of lost rewards? I throw those out as ideas. You can chew on that as you drive home tonight. Okay. They're probably wrong, but I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Chapter 33, verse 1. All that comes out of Numbers 32, right? <laughs> okay, now we have... In Numbers 33, we have... A, a, a summary of the journeys from Egypt to today. It's, a, it's an overview. And um, these are the journeys of the children of Israel who went forth out of the land of Egypt uh, with their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. And Moses wrote their goings out according to the journeys by the command of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. And they departed from Ramesses the first month. Fifteenth day of the first month, on the next day after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians. High hand meaning with a lot of spoil. They went well, well stocked. Uh, high on the hog would be the way we would probably say it down, down yonder. Huh? Um, verse 4, And the Egyptians buried uh, all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them, among their gods also, the Lord executed judgments. It's just a summary of the book of Exodus. Remember the ten plagues. They were against the hierarchy of the gods the Egyptians worshipped. You, to you and I, there are, flies, there are the flies and lice and frogs. If you study the Egyptian idolatry, they were against the Egyptian gods. And it was when the, when the, when the, the, the I think it was, it was the lice hit, that the priests themselves knew that God was God because, he, because of the nature of their worship. But also here we see that they, they bury, you know, the Egyptians, as you recall, made a big thing of burial. You know, their whole um, religious system was built around the Book of the Dead, the whole idea of the mummies and all the rest. I mean, they, 
to them, death was a big deal in terms of the ceremonial whole rigmarole. So they are busy uh, that's what, uh, uh, um, bearing their dead here in verse 4, which the Lord had smitten among them, and upon all the gods. So that's just a quick summary, verse 4 of the book of Exodus. Verse 5. And the children of Israel were removed from Ramesses and encamped in Sukkoth. They departed from Sukkoth and encamped at Etham, which is on the border of the wilderness. And they moved to Etham, turned again to a bunch of other names. Um, and I, rather than just butcher these names as we go down through these verses, uh, I hate to skip it all. Let me just see what we want to pick up here. Um, well, verse 8, they departed from there to uh, Pehi Yeroth and passed through the midst of the sea of the wilderness and went three days journey in the wilderness of Etham and camped at Marah. And they moved from Marah and came unto Elam and Elam were, uh, were twelve fountains of water and three score and ten palm trees and they encamped there. And they moved to Elam and then they camped by the Red Sea. And when they moved from the Red Sea they encamped by the wilderness of Sin. And they took their journey out of the wilderness of Sin and encamped at Dafka and they departed from Dafka and encamped at Halush and I'm just skimming quickly to see. I, rather than just go through all these names, which I uh, will allow you with your pronouncing dictionaries to go through on your own. Uh, the one thing I will mention as they go through this, um, it is very, very difficult to reconcile the geography from the various books, partly because the place names have changed. The one thing that is clear is there's been no effort made to reconcile by the scribes the the uh, details of the book of Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, etc. There are uh, all kinds of geographical debates among scholars as to exactly which place is where uh, without a, a large view graph or charts or maps uh, it's meaningless to try to discuss that without taking a look at the geography. The net of it is while there's broad agreement in general. Uh, there's all kinds of detailed uh, discussion about exactly which wadi was near which place and so forth. And uh, I've waded through a lot of that in preparation of this, but have not found any, number one, real significant issues emerge from that, um, uh, uh, nor any real violent disagreements other than just issues of, of place names and such. So uh, having said that, I acknowledge the fact that uh, that uh, these various stations of the journeys, as they sometimes called, uh, all kinds of scholars have slightly different opinions of exactly which place is where, but to no spiritual import, as far as I can see. So uh, we'll pick it up uh, down about um, uh, a couple do deserve mention. We get to verse 35. Departed from uh, Abronon and camped at Ezion Giber, which is the first harbor for King so which later becomes the first harbor for King Solomon's merchant marine. That's just a small point. Um, so King Solomon had quite a merchant navy, and uh, this was one of his first uh, major harbors. But anyway, uh, verse 38 makes reference of Aaron the priest, went up at Mount Hor, the commandment of the Lord, and died there in the 40th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt on the first day of the fifth month. That's the verse that pins down the exact time of Aaron's death. And Aaron was 123 years old when he would die in Mount Hor, right? And uh, he was 83, you see, when they were ready at Kadesh Barnea. But he's 40 years older now, and that's it. And um, and the king Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the Gev, in the land of Canaan, heard of the coming of the children of Israel. And they departed from Mount Hor and encamped, and on it goes, and listed a bunch of these other stations of the wanderings. Uh, verse 47, when they were removed from uh, another long name, and encamped in the mountains of Abiram and uh, before Nebo, they departed from the mountains of Abiram and encamped in the plains of Moab by the Jordan near Jericho. They encamped by the Jordan at uh, Beth Jeshemoth, even at Abel Shittim in the plains of Moab. Now, um, that is the summary, if you will, of the wilderness wanderings. Now we're going to pick up some laws. Verse 50, The Lord spake unto Moses in the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye are passed over the Jordan unto the land of Canaan, 
Then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their stone idols and destroy all their melted images and demolish all their high places. And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess. Who is the landlord of the planet Earth? The Creator Himself. Its predicament is the same as the land of Canaan was then. It is in possession of usurpers. Now, to you and I, that sounds strange, but that's exactly what... It's the landlord's right to dispossess the land of its tenants and give it to whomsoever he will. There's only one nation in the Scripture that is given title to any piece of property. The nation Israel has been given right to the land by the landlord, as here in summarized, verse 53. It's interesting that today our politics in almost every country on the planet Earth is burdened with the issue of who has the right to the land. We may not call it that, we don't hear in the assemblies people taking Genesis 12 or any of the references like this one to that basic root and making that... The, but that is the issue, isn't it? The whole debate about Israel, left bank, right bank, whatever, um, the West Bank, uh, that's a label that's been a, put on that land by Israel's enemies. We would call it Judea and Samaria. But the point is, the right to the land is the issue. Doesn't have any simple answers in, this, in a humanistic, social, political sense. It's a complicated issue. If it wasn't so complicated, it would have been resolved long ago. But it's been going on for thousands of years. And still, even in today's modern civilized society, it is the imponderable political issue. More thorny, probably, than any of the other ones that uh, uh, men of good intent and uh, sophisticated bearing uh, have to deal with. And uh, it's interesting that uh, the right to the land is uh, has its root. You know, you, you do a title search. You do a title search in California. You know, you take land back eventually, what, to the Spanish land grant or some, some root place. You're you, if you want to talk about the rights to the land in the Middle East, you come back to Genesis 12, where it was committed to Abraham. And here again, um, not only title reaffirmed, but possession directed by none other than God himself. You shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land that, and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess. God speaking. That is the root problem that we're dealing with. The, the recognition that it is their land. It's his land has been given to them for a possession, for an inheritance. Okay, verse 54. And you shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families. And to the more ye shall give the more inheritance, and to the fewer ye shall give less inheritance. Every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth. According to the tribes of your fathers ye shall inherit. And we're going to see something very interesting next uh, in the next chapter. But I'll get, we'll take that when we get there. Um, anyway, uh, see, the location by lot, the area ascribed each tribe by size, so that it's equal, you know, a proper, equally done. Um, even every man's inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth, according to the tribes of his fathers he shall inherit. But if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those whom ye let remain of them shall be barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. And that is exactly what happens. The ones they don't root out are uh, echoes of, through the rest of Israel's history in that part of the world. Verse 56, Moreover, it shall come to pass that I shall do unto you as I thought to do unto them. Ooh. 
Chapter 34, And the Lord spoke, spoke unto Moses, saying, Command the children of uh, Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall unto you for an inheritance, even the land of Canaan and the borders thereof. Then your south quarter shall be from the wilderness of Zin along the border of Edom, and your south border shall be the far end of the salt sea eastward. That's quite a bit of ground. And your border shall turn from the south to the ascent of the Akrabim, and pass on to Zin, and, and uh, going forth thereof shall be from the south of Kadesh Barnea, and shall go on to Hazar Adar, and pass on to Asmon. And the border shall go around Asmon unto the river of Egypt, and the termination of it shall be at the sea. And as for the western border, ye shall even have the great sea for a border. In other words, what you and I would call the Mediterranean. This shall be your west border. And this shall be your north border. From the great sea ye shall mark out for you Mount Hor. And from Mount Hor ye shall mark out for your border unto the entrance of Hamath. And unto the end of the border shall be Zedad. And the border shall go on from Ziphron. And the termination of it shall be at uh, Hazar Enon. And this shall be your north border. And it shall, and ye shall mark out your east border from Hazaranon to Shepham. And the border sh shall go down from Shepham to Ribla on the east side of Ain. And the border shall descend and shall reach unto the side of the Sea of Chinnereth, in other words, Sea of Galilee, uh, eastward. And the border shall go down to the Jordan. To the end of it shall be the Salt Sea, and it shall be your land with the borders thereof round about. So you just might want to mark those verses down when people start talking about a Palestinian state or anything else. Uh, the landlord has laid out the property lines. And Moses commanded the children of Israel, saying, This is the land which ye shall inherit by lot, which the Lord commanded to give unto the nine tribes and to the half tribe. In other words, nine and a half on the one side, two and a half on the other. For the tribe of the children of Reuben, according to the house of their fathers, and the tribe of the children of Gad, according to the house of their fathers, have received their inheritance, and the half-tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance. The two and a half tribes have received their inheritance on this side of the Jordan near Jericho, eastward toward the sun rising. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, These are the names of the men who shall divide the land unto you, Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun. And ye shall take one prince of every tribe, and divide the land by inheritance. And the names of the men are these. The tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Juna, Jephunneh. The tribe of uh, the children of Simeon, Shemuel, the son of Amahud. Of the tribe of Benjamin, Elidad, the son of Chislon. And the prince of the tribe of the children of Dan, Bukai, the son of Joglai. And the children, <laughs> yeah, right. The prince of the children of Joseph, for the tribe of the children of Manasseh, Heniel, and the son of Ephod, and the prince of the tribe of the children of Ephraim, Kemuel, the son of Shiftan, and the prince of the tribe of the children of Zebulun, Eliazaphan, and the son of Parnach, and the, tri the prince of the tribe of the children of Issachar, uh, Paltiel, the son of Ezan, uh, anyway, the prince of the tribe of the children of Asher, Ahai, Hud, the son of Shilomai, and the prince of the tribe of the children of Naphtali, uh, Pedu-Pedael, and um, the son of Amihud. <laughs> These are they whom the Lord commanded to divide the inheritance of the children of Israel in the land of Canaan. This is one of those places where the details can throw you, because you can tell my clumsy pronunciation going through that. You didn't get much out of that. But let's see how many of you are paying attention. Did any of you notice an amazing coincidence in that list? If you take the tribes in pairs, you go from south to north in order that they ultimately inherited by lot. And later on in Joshua, they're going to cast lots, right? And the land will be laid out for them by lot giving the geography its names by tribe. You know, in your Bible maps, you often see a map for this, from this period of time on, which the geography has tribal names. Because at once after, after, the conquest, after the conquest of Canaan, 
the land, the, the geography and the tribal names are coincident because the tribes are allocated that land, that's their inheritance, and it stays with that tribe, okay? What's interesting, this is Numbers 34. That doesn't take place until Joshua, end of Joshua, after the land is conquered. They cast lots, and the Lord allocates the land to these tribes. What a coincidence. You realize coincidence is not a kosher word? Here we have, you know, now, now the cynics, by the way, you will find scholars that obviously this wasn't written then by Moses. This was written after the conquest of Joshua because it's in that order. Nonsense. Jesus Christ is not a liar. Jesus ascribed each of the five books of the Torah to Moses. And Moses died before the conquest of Canaan. And after the conquest of Canaan, these are the these tribes did in fact get allocated by lot the areas, and uh, they are in this order from south to north. So I think that's interesting. It's one of those little observations that may mean a lot to you, may mean nothing to you. I think I, mean, I personally think it's very very exciting. Now one other comment, just sort of an overview, so that we're sort of wrapping up the book of Numbers. I, I like to remind you of something else. Um, and I didn't discover this originally. I got I was on a I was being briefed by the Ministry of Defense. I was on a Department of Defense visit in Israel, and um, it happened that we were being briefed by a young rabbi, and his real mission had to do with just pointing out why they, and he did by the way, very very eloquently, link their claim to the land back to the Torah, to Genesis 12 and so forth. But in his in his briefing to these officers. Um, bunch of foreign officers who were visiting. Um, uh, and it was sort of just an intelligence background kind of briefing, but one of the things he pointed out is that they faced dispossessing the land of ten tribes, uh, ten nations. Three of them were dispossessed before Joshua. Sihon, Og, and the Midianites, right? Joshua takes over a few books later and takes them into the land and conquers the seven nations that are left. The king, the king of the Amorites and Jericho. Jericho is their strong. He takes the toughest one first, Jericho first, and of course um, the rest during the, in, the, in the whole book of Joshua. What's interesting to me, it blew me away, because I had never, even though I knew the details, I hadn't put it in perspective before, and I'm sure this young rabbi had no perspective of the book of Revelation particularly. But the idea that there are ten nations three fall and the seven left, which is a model described by Daniel, a model described by Revelation in 17 and 18 and elsewhere in 13. This whole model, of, again, to the extent that the conquest of, by Israel of Canaan is a microcosm led by Joshua, one other Yehoshua will dispossess, dispossess the land, the planet in total, of its usurpers by defeating what? Ten nations. Three go down first, leaving seven. There's seven heads and ten horns that we read about so often in Daniel. So, so to the extent that I'm, I'm fascinated, the degree to which the book of Joshua is a model of the book of Revelation, but there are three nations not mentioned in Joshua because they're already dealt with by the time Joshua takes over. And that's what we've been going through here in the last part of the book of Numbers. So uh, I think that's kind of interesting, just as, as a... Okay, that brought us to chapter 35. Now you recall that there's actually 13 tribes. We speak of the 12 tribes, but we have actually 13 to select our 12 from because uh, there's, there's 12 tribes that inherit the land if you don't count the Levites. Remember? We've been through that. Well, the Levites do, they're real, and they don't have inheritance in the sense of land, in the sense that the tribes do, but they are given a place to live. Forty-eight cities are singled out, scattered throughout the, the land, to be the location. I won't say in the inheritance, because we're not talking title of ground now, but the place that they live are in these 48 cities. And let's just skim through the first to five verses of chapter 35. Number 35, the Lord spake again to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan near Jericho, saying, Command the children of Israel that they give unto the Levites of the inheritance of their possession, cities to dwell in. And ye shall give also unto the Levites pasture lands for the cities round about them. And the cities shall have to and the cities shall they have to dwell in. 
and the environs of them shall be for their cattle, and for their goods, and for all their beasts. And their pasture lands of the cities, which ye shall give unto the Levites, shall reach from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits round about. Okay? So that's roughly uh, 2,000 cubits is about a half a mile. Right? So these 48 cities add up to about 73 square miles, for those of you that are quick with arithmetic, which ain't all bad, I guess. And, uh, uh, and ye shall measure... And it, the, the estimates are, by the way, the Levites were no better, no worse off than their contemporaries. That was sort of the people who have studied the economics of this. That what it seems to suggest is that they were to be taken care of, you know, uh, while the arithmetic derives from their economic system, when you go through all that, you get the impression that they're, they're, they, uh, they didn't do badly. Um, and you shall measure from outside the city on the east side 2,000 cubits, and on the south side 2,000 cubits, and on the west side 2,000 cubits, and the north side 2,000 cubits, and the city shall be in the midst. And this shall be to them the pasture lands of the cities. Now, it's interesting what God was seeming to do here, and that is to avoid having all the Levites congregate in one place. That would be the natural tendency. We all have a common profession, a common interest, and there would be a tendency for them to coalesce in one place. God seemed to do just the opposite. He forced them to be scattered in 48 cities throughout the land. In so doing, we can learn several lessons. First of all, it was a... Uh, it was a method of providing unity to the nation because throughout the land there are these pockets of the Levites that would unite the land in, in, the, in their national heritage. Um, something else, though, it's also a, uh, they didn't have, these cities were not uniquely Levitical, Levitical cities. They were just the cities that the Levites were allowed to commingle with the, because they, the, the, they were in a t tribal territory. So the people from that tribe also living in the cities. They were co-mingling. It was not a monastic order. Quite the opposite. And this is reminiscent of um, what John said, what uh, Jesus says in John seventeen fifteen, is that he's, he, he's, he wants us to not to, not to be of the world, but to be in the world. It's not a call. It's not to call. It's not a call to a monastic order. Okay. Now we get into another interesting institution. And that's these cities of refuge. Six of these 48 cities have a special designation that is extremely instructive for us to, to understand. Um, we're going to have six cities, three on the east of the, east of the Jordan and three on the west. And um, it might be useful, before we go any further, to hold your finger here and go to Exodus 21. And in Exodus 21, we have some, uh, some rules laid down. In Exodus 21, verse 12, we have some rules about personal injuries. He that smiteth a man so that he die, he shall surely be put to death. Now, if some of you are not in favor of capital punishment, you may have a problem with Exodus 21, 12. And I won't raise that whole debate here. But it's certainly clear, at least here, that God did not mess around. That was his rule. He that smiteth a man so that he die, he shall be surely put to death. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I shall appoint thee a place to which he shall flee. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from my altar, that he may die. And on it goes. And this is just a summary. The scripture makes a distinction between premeditated murder and manslaughter. If it's premeditated murder, no question about it, the guy dies. If it's manslaughter, the next of kin went after him. And the closest in blood to the person the yeah, closest, closest blood relative to the person that died took it on itself. It's, it's a classic blood feud kind of idea. He would go after, he would avenge his family's loss. 
by going after the slayer. The avenger couldn't care less whether it was premeditated or manslaughter. He went after the guy that did the deed. What we're going to discover is the guy, if the guy, the guy that is in flight, if he can get to a city of refuge and can prove that it was not premeditated, he's, he enjoys safety from the avenger of blood. That's the basic concept of the city of refuge. There was a place. So if you were guilty, you know, if by negligence or something, someone died at your, through your hand, not premeditated murder, you beat it out of there fast and headed for a city of refuge. And if you made it to the city of refuge and could convince them that it was, in fact, manslaughter, you had security for a certain period of time. We'll get into all that. That's all. That, this, is, that, that, this is just suggested in Exodus 21 and also Deuteronomy 19. Here in Numbers 35, we're going to have established the rules of the cities of refuge, which in Joshua later on are going to be fulfilled. It's an interesting issue here because there's some strange things about the city of refuge. Numbers 35, verse 6. Among the cities which he shall give unto the Levites... There shall be six city, cities for refuge, which ye shall assign for the manslayer, that he may flee there. And to them ye shall add forty and two cities. In other words, there will be six cities of refuge plus forty-two others for the Levites. That's all he's saying there. So all the cities which ye shall give to the Levites shall be forty and eight cities. Uh, them uh, shall ye give uh, with their environs. And the cities ye shall give shall be of a possession to the children of Israel. From those who have many, uh, ye shall give many. And from those who have few, ye shall give few. Everyone shall give of his cities uh, unto the Levites according to his inheritance, which he inherited. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye are come over the Jordan unto the land of Canaan, then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee there who killeth any person unintentionally. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. These cities which ye shall give, six cities shall ye have for refuge. Ye shall give three cities on this side of the Jordan, and three cities shall ye give in the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. Now, I, I personally can't help but speculate. You've got two and a half tribes, three cities for two and a half tribes on the east of the Jordan, and three cities for nine and a half on the other side. I assume they had a higher degree of incidence of manslaughter on the east of the Jordan. I don't know. I have no basis for that. It's just simple arithmetic. It intrigues me. In any case, verse 15, These six cities shall be for refuge, both for the children of Israel and for the stranger, that is the foreigner, um, and for the sojourner among them, that everyone who killeth any person unintentionally may flee there. And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. And the murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he smite him with throwing a stone, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. And the murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smite him with a hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. The avenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. You know, it's good, good, simple, primitive stuff that makes good movies, right? Verse 20. But if he thrust him from hatred or hurl at him by lying in wait that he die, or in enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death, for he is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. But if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, or have cast upon him anything without lying in wait, or with any stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him that he die, and was not his enemy, neither sought he his harm. This is, for those of you, this is res ipsa loquitur, if you're an attorney, right? Or you and I, as far as, we're, as far as we're concerned, what it has to do is it's the scriptural way of trying to distinguish between you and I would call manslaughter versus premeditated murder. That's the distinction. Premeditated murder, the avenger in blood kills him. If it's manslaughter, that's what he's dealing with here. Then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the avenger of blood according to these ordinances. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge to which he was fled. And he shall abide in it unto the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. But if the slayer shall at any time 
come outside the border of the city of his refuge, to which he was fled, and the avenger of blood find him outside the borders of the city of his refuge. Then the avenger of blood shall kill the slayer. He shall not be guilty of his blood, because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return to the land of his possession. So these things shall be for a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses, but one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. Moreover, ye shall take no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. And he shall take no ransom for him who has fled to the city of his refuge, that he should come again to dwell in the land until the death of the high priest. So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are, for blood defileth the land. And the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. Basic scriptural principle, which to the best of my awareness is not repealed in the New Testament. So those of you that have trouble with that, uh, my encouragement to study further. Verse 34, Defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit wherein I dwell, for I, the Lord, dwell among the children of Israel. Now, get the picture here. If you were guilty of premeditated murder, there is no refuge. You might make it to the city of refuge, the Avengers are on your heels, but the, at the city of refuge, they'll have a hearing. And if, if they determine that you were premeditated, you're dead. They hand you over to the Avenger of blood, and he killed you. And he's not guilty of murder. If you are guilty of manslaughter, and you're on your way to the city of refuge, and the guy catches up with you, you're out of luck. You know? Um, so if you're going to be, you know, it's important in those days, I guess, I don't know if they had insurance policies, but I'm sure they had running shoes, you know? <laughs> so you make it to the city of refuge, and you have your hearing, and you convince the elders of the city that you are guilty of manslaughter. You were stuck in the city of refuge. You didn't get your freedom. Outside the wall, this relative of the slain is lurking, maybe, waiting for you. And if you're outside, <clears throat> you know, take a little jaunt through the orchard, you're done. Even though you're a man, even though you're, a, you know, guilty of manslaughter and been acquitted, so to speak, by this, you know, it's, it's not like you and I would do it. So he would say, gee, if he's off, he's off, he can go home with his family. No, his family would have to move there if they're going to be together. He, they have to come to the city of refuge. And he has to be in the city of refuge how long? Till the death of the high priest. Now, here's what's interesting about this whole thing. What on earth does the death of the high priest have anything to do with law? There's a rule, there's a procedure, there's a social system here. Fine. Why? What happens at the death of the high priest? The slayer goes free, right? Now, all of this gets more interesting when you understand the Hebrew words. The word avenger in this chapter is a Hebrew word called goel. The same word in the book of Ruth, which is used of the kinsman redeemer. He's the nearest kinsman. In the book of Ruth, he's the kinsman redeemer in the sense of the goel doing the redemption. Here he is the goel in the sense of the avenger of blood, the nearest kinsman. Now, it's interesting that the slayer, the manslaughter, if he gets to the city of refuge and goes through that, and he's now allowed to live, but in the city of in the city of refuge only, until the high priest dies. Why? Because the high priest is regarded as the goel for the whole nation. And what's fascinating about this whole chapter is the typology, the trigger that it's a type is the death of the high priest. That's got nothing to do with the judicial system. It's got nothing to do with jurisprudence, that he's got this protection until the high priest dies. What's that got to do with anything? Only to point to the type. Who is the high priest a type of? Our high priest. What gives you your freedom and mine? The death of our high priest. When our high priest dies, we're free. we are free because of the death of the high priest. So the cities of refuge, in a strange sense, clearly are a type of Christ. You gain your 
protection from death by fleeing to the city of refuge. And as long as you are in Christ, you're free. You're, uh, your correction, you have your protection from death. You're free through the death of the high priest. The whole thing, you either see it or you don't. I'll let you sort of. Yeah. All right. Now, just as the Jubilee year returned land from its indentures, if you were poor and you sold your property, which really is a lease, at the Jubilee year, it came back to, the, to those that, uh, to which it was indentured uh, or, or sold from originally. And what the Jubilee year was to the land, the death of the high priest was to the, the people who had taken refuge in the cities of refuge. So, uh, interesting, interesting issue. Um, okay. Um, how far did we get here? To the end of the chapter, we make it all the way? Yeah, okay, good. Okay. Chapter 36, her timing is perfect. Chapter 36, the book of Numbers. And the principal fathers of the children, uh, of, of the families of the children of Gilead, son of Machir, uh, the son of Manasseh, and the families of the sons of Joseph came near and spoke to Moses before the princes and the principal fathers of the children of Israel. And he said, The Lord commanded my Lord to give the land for inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of Zelophehad, the our brother, unto his daughters. And, and if they be married to any of the sons uh, of the other tribes of the children of Israel, then shall their inheritance be taken from the inheritance of our fathers and shall be put in the inheritance of the tribe wherewith they are received. So it shall be taken from our, the lot of our inheritance. In other words, it's a practical, we talked about this, the practical problem of this commitment to the daughters of Zelophehad has the risk of disrupting these tribal boundaries. And when the jubilee of the children of Israel shall be, then shall their inheritance be put in the inheritance of the tribe whereunto they were received, so shall their inheritance be taken away from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. And Moses commanded the children of Israel, according to the word of the Lord, saying, The tribe of the sons of Joseph had said well. This is the thing which the Lord doth command concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, Let them marry to whom they think best, only to the family of the tribe of their father shall they marry. In other words, pick anyone they like as long as in their own tribe. And that will that'll take care of all of that. And we talked about how this applies to Mary and Joseph in Luke, right? So shall not the inheritance of the children of Israel move from the tribe to tribe. Every one of the children of Israel shall keep himself to the inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter who possesses the inheritance of any tribe of the children of Israel shall be the wife unto one of the family of the tribe of her father, so that the children of Israel may enjoy every man the inheritance of his fathers. Moses laying down the rules to, to keep coherent this law of inheritance for the tribes. But interestingly enough, uh, C.I. Schofield uh, is credited with the first, in, the first recorded insight, recognizing that the claims, the Messianic claims of Christ, also hang on this, this uh, uh, legal element. Verse 9, Neither shall the inheritance be transferred from one tribe to another tribe, but every one of the tribes of the children of Israel shall keep himself to his own inheritance. Even as the Lord commanded Moses, so did the daughters of Zelophehad. For Mala, Tirzah, and Hogla, and Milcah, and Noah, the daughters of Zelophehad, were married unto their fathers, brothers, sons, and they were married unto the families of the sons of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and their inheritance remained in the tribe of the family of their father. These are the commandments and the ordinances which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses unto the children of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan uh, near Jericho. Interesting, one of the fundamental lessons, spiritual lessons in this whole issue, getting the land and the inheritance and getting all that stuff, the main idea was is that each member of the tribe was, in, was to be satisfied with their own lot and not to seek inheritance after alien properties. That's the other part of it that is, is, uh, underlies all this. And that's also the lesson for you and I. One of the things that comes um, through all of this, I think, uh, whether, uh, the, the, the key lessons as I tried to think about uh, what are the what do you take away from all this detail uh, the last few chapters? I think the, I tend to see the Midianite issue as one of putting, the, putting to death sinful lusts in our life, not compromising, not leaving room. Uh, the more you read the Old Testament and the New, the more you read Paul's letters, we need to have an uncompromising um, uh, attitude towards the, uh, to uh, fleshly lusts or they'll destroy us. Leaving any provision will be our undoing. That was what was true in terms of Israel's dealing with the uh, the Canaanites and the Midianites. 
Uh, that's also true in your life and mine. Um, but when we fail, and we will, there are the cities of refuge. Taken in a very specific context, of course, here in, in, uh, in, uh, in the context of Israel, but also as a type in Christ, where we flee for refuge. Where? Into, 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 into Christ. And uh, we are indeed not restricted to a local locale because we are freed indeed by the death of our high priest. That ends our rather superficial, cursory summary of the book of Numbers. Uh, the uh, fourth book of the Torah, or the Pentateuch, as it's called. Um, I'm not sure what we'll take on. I think what we'll do next time, it's been suggested we might just have kind of a loose wrap next Monday night, because we, we, we have a break, if you will. So rather than start the next book next Monday, we'll have a wrap session and just have bring questions. And uh, if they're real easy questions, I'll answer them. And if they're real hard questions, I'll send you to Chuck, okay? But um, uh, we'll just have a rap session, and, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, t- we'll let that go where it will, and, and see that be kind of, we should do that every once in a while anyway. And then we'll take a break, at least, I think, one Monday night, and then we'll take on a new book. My instincts would be to uh, go to the New Testament for a change of pace. Somewhere along the way, I want to come back to the book of Deuteronomy to finish up the Torah, but I think we've probably had enough laws and Levites and priests and stuff for a while. So uh, we'll take a break and we'll go into the New Testament, maybe the, maybe maybe the Gospel of Mark, something like that, or one of the epistles. I'm going to talk to Chuck about that, and uh, it is blessing on what we do. And uh, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. I know uh, we don't we don't take offerings here, as you know. And one thing I've often said that I, I covet uh, more than anything else your prayers, and I do that. But I'm also going to suggest something else. I know many of you I get from your letters and other things have have really held me and my family up in prayer, and I, I'm very grateful for that. I'd also like to commend to you. You might, when you the Lord leads you, hold up in prayer the people that support this ministry. There's a lot of invisible support that makes this all work, particularly the tape ministry. Bill Twyham, Jerry Gustin, and their families give a great deal for you and I. Every Monday night, they're here, lugging that gear, getting it up, and all the work that goes behind and the editing and getting the tapes out. So all of you know the tapes are available for free. The people that give up themselves to do that, there's just lots of volunteers behind the v- several different tape ministries that uh, are here. So I know they would covet your prayers, too, because their, their, their families and their home life have all the problems you have. It's not all peaches and cream, and I know that they're, 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 they would uh, um, appreciate. Uh, you think of this, to those of you as you led to pray for the study, pray specifically for the, the gang that supports it. Let's bar our hearts. Father, we just praise you with thanksgiving that you have given, of, given us this time to get together and to open your word. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Father, that you have brought us here to this moment in time by your Holy Spirit. But we know indeed there are no coincidences in your kingdom. And we thank you, Father, for those lessons that are here for our learning. We would pray, Father, that you would make clear to our hearts those particular elements that apply to each and every one of our lives. We would also ask you, Father, for an increased hunger for the bread of life. We would just ask you, Father, to, to, to help us find more opportunity to study more deeply and to be increasingly sensitive to those things that you have here for us that indeed we might perceive those unique ministries that you have for each and every one of us. That in all these things, Father, we might be more effective, more pleasing in thy sight, O Lord, our strength. 